All law enforcement professionals recognize that every homicide is an immense tragedy. It impacts individuals, families, and can often impact broad communities. However, we are here today to announce the filing of criminal charges related to two homicides and one attempted homicide that occurred under a most unusual set of circumstances. These types of homicides are best known as serial killings. It's a series of chance-like detached killings that can defy a community's perception of danger and safety. These types of anonymous, seemingly haphazard killings can create a real sense of fear and unease, particularly among those who may identify as part of a targeted population. In this case, the targeted population were Miami-Dade's homeless, men who sleep outdoors in our community. These are some of our most vulnerable individuals in our community. Having an unknown killer striking out at random victims is like no other type of crime to solve. Thanks to the fine work of the City of Miami Police Department in conjunction with my attorneys from the state attorney's office. You, by the way, I said this earlier. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to repeat this. And uh, uh, Deputy Chief Armando Aguilar, great work by your detectives, your whole team. I know that you're as proud of them as we are. So we are all here today to let our community know that these seemingly random killings have been solved. And they were committed by Willie Suarez Maceo. If you look over to the screen there, you will see um, that he is being charged today with two first-degree murders and one attempted murder. Now, you know, I always say one of the greatest assets of our community is collaboration. So what you see here today deserves a lot of praise. Everyone here deserves praise for their outstanding work in piecing this puzzle together. They are. Of course, the City of Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Everyone knows you. We're very proud of your work of your department. Um, our interim chief, Manuel Manuel uh, Morales, I'm sorry, is not here today. He wanted to be, but instead he sent his uh, deputy assistant chief, Armando Aguilar. And Armando, I have to tell you, excellent work, super work. You must be very proud. We have ATF special agent in charge of the Miami Field Office, Christopher Robinson. and. I have to say, some of the best prosecutors in the United States, I call them the best team in America. We have here my chief assistant, Kathleen Hogue, and next to her on her left is Assistant State Attorney Ruben Scolavino, who is really the one that worked, both of them did, uh, day in and day out, 24 hours 7 with the detectives. Now, the Miami police detectives themselves, who deserve so much credit, are Detective Ebony Robinson. Detective Edward Tobin, Detective Bernard Tellez, Detective Jermaine Brisino, May Major William Cook, and Sergeant Fabio Sanchez and Sergeant Emmanuel Prosper. Broadly speaking, a serial killing can be defined as the unlawful homicide of at least two people, carried out by the same person in separate events occurring at different times. The evidence pieced together by the City of Miami Police Department's Homicide Unit has provided what we believe to be sufficient evidence for my office to charge 25-year-old Willie Maceo with two counts of first-degree murders, I said. I'm sorry, the first count for first-degree murders for the October 16, 2021 killing of 59-year-old Manuel Perez and for the December 21st, 2021 killing of 56-year-old Jerome Antonio Price. And again, for the December 21st, 2021 attempted murder of 58-year-old Jorge Jardines, for which he was already in custody. So let me try to piece that all together for everyone. As I said, this was a result of good police investigative work possibly worthy of a modern-day Sherlock Holmes. The homicide detectives put together 
what turns out to be a mosaic of information that led to the charges that my office filed today. Since most serial killers murder strangers, as was the situation in this investigation, detecting or apprehending the perpetrator is always dramatically different. It's harder. The process of gathering and connecting pertinent data is made dramatically harder to collect. So this case begins on the evening of October 16th, 2021, at about 9 p.m. on a sidewalk in downtown Miami. Miami police and fire rescue were dispatched to 27 Southeast 1st Street in reference to a male bleeding profusely with lacerations to his neck. This homicide was later identified as 59-year-old Manuel Perez. Mr. Perez was, a home, was homeless and he'd been sleeping outside on the sidewalk at the time of his stabbing. Two witnesses heard Mr. Perel, Perez yelling, help, help. One saw, one witness saw a man making an up and down, upward and downward movement as if striking the victim. The man was described as a thin built black male, 26 to 27 years of age, short hair, clean shaven, and wearing a black t-shirt. Surveillance video from a nearby business captured a clear picture of an individual matching that description. So now if you would, let's go over to uh, Angel the video. Uh, it's gonna take just a few minutes. We tried to fast motion it for you. But what you're first gonna see here is uh, business cameras catch a car there. Do you see that car that's in yellow circle? What's distinguishing about that is keep, you can keep going in. So you're gonna watch it park. If you can see it there, it's now parking. Lights are off. You see a man get out, if you can follow that yellow circle. Do you see that going up and around? He goes the other direction for a moment and then he turns back around and he comes back down the street towards us, towards where we're standing. You will then see him cross the street and now you catch another business camera. We're very proud of our business community, right Mr. Mayor? Yep. You can see him now walking towards that area. And if you just stop right there, there's a good photograph of him right there. So now we continue. We continue, Angel, thank you. And now that catch, the camera's catching it from the other direction. You see him walking, where we believe he's walking towards the scene of the crime. Then about approximately two minutes later, we didn't play all of this for obvious reasons, you will see him now coming back, running away from the scene, and again, he's captured on the security camera there. So if we leave it there for a second, so despite the clear picture, the detectives lacked any other clues to provide an actual identification of that man in that video. Another witness identified the suspicious individual running past him on a nearby street. This led to a review of additional surveillance videos that were captured, that did capture some very suspicious and unusual activity of a black four-door Dodge Charger driving in the specific downtown area related to the homicide. The Charger is going to become the key to this. You'll see how we tie it in. While there was no video recording of the actual homicide, the video does show the same suspect running away, like we just saw, from the area and back towards the same Dodge Charger and entering the vehicle. So now let's go back to where that parked Charger was. That's capturing his face. 
You, he goes back down the other direction, and he's retracing pretty much his steps back to his car. You see him there, crossing the street, and he gets back into, now running, and, and you see the lights go on, that car right there. And that becomes significant because what I'm told was a critical piece. Watch the car now. This is other surveillance. You got it. Stop right there, Angel, if you would. Angel? Anyway, you see the outline of, maybe you gentlemen know this, but what I didn't know was that the outline of those lights, see how it's got a circle on either side and then the cross in between? That is apparently a very um, pa distinctive pattern of Dodgers, so Dodge Chargers. So that becomes relevant later on. But after this, the police didn't have anything else. The homicide investigation went cold. There was no additional information that allowed them to identify this face or the dark colored charger vehicle that the subject had used. So here what we're gonna do, uh, well, you'll see how everything begins to change when the killer strikes again one month later at approximately 8.04 8 p.m. on December 21st, 2021. A city of Miami police officer was flagged down uh, who while he was patrolling in the downtown Miami area, the officer was told there was a male bleeding from his head nearby. The officer then located Jorge Jardines on the sidewalk with a possible injury to his head. Mr. Jardines was conscious and he was able to speak to the officer. Jardines indicated that he was homeless, that he was lying down on the sidewalk, sleeping, when he woke up to find himself bleeding. It was later determined that the injury was the result of gunshot wound to the head. Fortunately, he survived. He is the victim of our attempted murder charge. However, the investigation discovered a critical piece of evidence, a nine millimeter spent casing. It was located a few feet away from where Mr. Hardinas was sleeping. Also, there was a set of footprints that was also found next to the spent casing. Less than two hours after the shooting of Mr. Hardinas, approximately 10 o'clock, the short of 10 o'clock, earlier on December 21st, the city of Miami police had responded to a 911 call of an unresponsive male laying on the sidewalk in Wynwood at 45 Northwest 21st Street. Upon arrival, the police found members of the Miami Fire Rescue Team attempting to render aid to an unresponsive male. The deceased was identified as 56-year-old Jerome Antonio Price. Mr. Price appeared to be homeless and was believed to be sleeping on the sidewalk where he was found. Police observed what appeared to be five gunshot wounds to Mr. Price's back, and they discovered five nine millimeter bullet casings that were recovered near Mr. Price's body. Area video footage showed that about 18 minutes before Mr. Price's body was discovered, there was what appeared to be a dark charger drove past where Mr. Price was laying on the ground sleeping and it slowed down. The car then intentionally reverses its course with the front driver window ending up across from where Mr. Price was sleeping. The video showed several firearm muzzle flashes coming from the front driver's window of the dark colored sedan in Mr. Price's direction. And if you will, just for a moment, I'm gonna to call to your attention, Kathleen. Excuse me a second. Okay. I'm gonna step over here. Um, okay, Angel, you can roll the footage, please. Okay, I think you can see it. It's hard to see, but if you just allow me to point it out. So stop for a second. Okay, keep going for a second. Can you see, okay. There it is. Do you see right there? That's Mr. Price just lying, sleeping, not bothering anyone, homeless. There's the car. It drives by, and then watch what happens. I want to get in your way. Okay, the point of this is when he reverses, 
out of his window, you'll see that is a flash, the muzzle flash of the bullets going towards Mr. Price. You'll see another one. Go ahead. There it is. That's one, another one. Remember, there were five of those. You see the So now the point of this is when the police get that video, they're then able to at least catch the last three digits of the tag. You'll see it's matched up there. But what they did find was the last three was an N and a 59. And then the detectives worked really hard with the real-time crime uh, readers and, and technology that they have. They were able to piece together from all of their closed circuit television cameras in the area, the actual license plate. And so you can see there, the actual license plate is what they found, and it's on that car, the Dodger. This was a key break to start stripping at the anonymity away from this alleged mystery killer. That tag number came back to a 2015 four-door black Dodge Charger. A connection with this type of car was also noted in the unsolved October 16, 2021 killing of Manuel Perez. The black Dodge Charger was registered to 25-year-old Willie Suarez Maceo. The black Dodge Charger was seen circling in the area before Mr. Price's shooting. This vehicle was captured on video in close proximity to the area before and after the shooting of Mr. Price. The next day, in the afternoon, the police located the black charger outside of Suarez Maceo's place of work. He was observed sitting uh, as the sole occupant of his car, sitting in the front driver's side of the car. The police approached him and stopped him as he came out of the vehicle. Police then did a pat down for officer safety, conducted that, and it revealed a loaded black Glock 19 9 millimeter caliber handgun in the right front waistband of his pants. In this video, you will see the man, the car, and the gun. There's the man, there's the car, there's the man, the car. And now you'll see the gun. This gun was later impounded and secured by the City of Miami Police Department. Later analysis of the Black Glock 19 connected the firearm that was recovered to the spent 9mm casings mm -hmm. that were recovered next to the body of Mr. Price and next to the victim, Mr. Hardinas. ATF, again, they're such great partners to all of us in law enforcement, assisted us in this analysis and we are very grateful to them. Additionally, there was cell site data from a cell phone that was recovered from the defendant's person, also indicated that the defendant was in close proximity to where both Mr. Hardinas and Mr. Perez were shot on December 21st. Mr. Price and Mr. Hardinas are the victims of the two murder charges. Upon learning that Willie Suarez Maceo was presently living at 445 Northwest 4th Street, search warrants with the great help of our great lawyers here, uh, were issued for the residents and for the car. These also supplied additional evidence and video in this case, such as articles of clothing that were described by the witnesses. Red shoes, for instance, was one of the examples which had soles that were consistent with the footprints. Remember I mentioned the footprints to you earlier? That were left at the scene of Mr. Hardinas at the December 21st shooting. Additional video evidence was obtained relating to events occurring at the residence just after the homicide. So again, 
I want to applaud the work of the City of Miami Police Department, of all of our partners in law enforcement, because in this community, we won't tolerate crimes against the voiceless, the vulnerable, the homeless. We are so happy that we were able to find justice in this darkness that was committed by this anonymous killer who did this in the shadows. And now we brought this out to the light of justice. And there you have uh, our serial murder is what we believe to be and why he was charged today. So with that, um, I'm going to ask the mayor of our beautiful city to please say a few words. Thank you. Uh, it's sort of hard to follow that. Um, very comprehensive, cogent, um, detailed presentation of the spectacular work done by the state attorney, her office, and the city of Miami Police Department. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just incredible to see the detail, um, the follow through, the technology that was used uh, to capture the images and the information necessary to bring this serial killer to justice. Uh, as the state attorney said, first of all, we're going to protect everyone in our city. We're very blessed that we have a city of hardworking, dedicated police officers, men and women, um, who last year, um, while we're focusing today on a heinous crime that thankfully has been solved in a very comprehensive manner, I want to highlight the fact that last year we had a 23% reduction in homicides, a 14% reduction in contact shootings. And that's because we've invested in our men and women in law enforcement, not only at the city level, but also with the state attorney in initiatives that we have done with her office, where she has asked for additional resources, investigatory resources on contact shootings. Um, we have partnered together for a long period of time uh, to make sure that our citizens are safe. And of that, I'm very proud. Um, as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I can tell you, I just came from Chicago a couple of days ago, and they are struggling. A lot of urban cities across America are struggling. But it is thanks to the hard work of our men and women, thanks to the business community, as the state attorney highlighted, and their uh, closed circuit cameras, which we depend upon mm -hmm. that technology, including other technology that we used, uh, Nibin machine technology that we acquired uh, for ballistics and uh, matching the, the shell casings, um, cell phone technology, obviously collaboration and cooperation with our cell phone partners. Um, and so I, I just, I'm so proud uh, to be here and so thankful that the state attorney would invite me to be here and to let you all know that we have uh, uh, someone off the streets uh, that was preying on the most vulnerable in our community and we have the people behind me to thank for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome Ron Book. Come in, Ron, please join us. Uh, and uh, Ron, when he found out, I, I know you know he's been working on this issue for 26 years. And I'm going to call Chief Armando Aguilar up, and then if you'd like to say a few words, uh, we'd, we'd like to hear from you, and we want to praise you for your years, decades of dedication to our homeless, our vulnerable. So, Chief, Deputy Chief, oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Madam State Attorney and, uh, and Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Armando Aguilar, Assistant Chief of Police uh, with the City of Miami Police Department. Uh, just wanted to add a few words that this, this particular uh, set of cases, while, while tragic, is truly a testament to the strength of our community, to the strength of our, of our public safety in, in Miami. Uh, it, it involves, from the very outset, uh, in light of this, this horrific series of incidents, members of the community that, that had a choice to make. They could, have, they could have said, well, that's not my business. I'm going to mind my own business. Uh, they chose to do the right thing. They chose to, to, to summon help uh, for these people that, that our killer uh, believed very much that society had forgotten. Well, they had not been forgotten. They had not been forgotten by the, the citizens that came to their aid, uh, by the members of the Miami Police Department who dedicated countless hours to solving this case. The, the, these. Th these series of, uh, of killings and, and the attempted murder involved the work of men and women at every division of the Miami Police Department. I'm also proud uh, to have uh, Assistant Chief Sharice Gauze and Assistant Chief Thomas Carroll, my counterparts uh, of the Field Operations Division and the uh, Administration Division. This, is, this was truly an all-hands effort by members of the Miami Police Department. When you look at the, 
the traditional investigative steps that went into this, as well as the, the technology that was utilized, the, our, our NIBIN uh, machine, our, our National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, that, uh, that again is, is the fruit of our great partnership with the, uh, with the ATF. And we're, we're very happy to have uh, Special Agent in Charge uh, Robinson and uh, Assistant Special Agent in Charge uh, Mercer of the Miami Field Office with us. Uh, again, our, our real-time crime center, which includes license plate readers, uh, uh, public safety cameras, public safety partnerships where we share video feeds with, uh, with, private, uh, with private businesses. You heard the state attorney talk about a, what is a serial killing? What are, what are serial killings? So serial killings are, again, a, a series of two or more murders separated by at least a few weeks and, uh, and, and, and that share a common theme. When we look at the speed at which this case was, uh, was solved, we're talking about two shootings that happened on the same day within a couple of hours of each other. Within 24 hours, because we're conducting our, our ballistics testing in-house, within 24 hours, those two scenes by ballistic evidence were matched to each other. When we retrieved the gun from the suspect, w again, within 24 hours, that firearm is linked to those two scenes, the, the, the firearm that was, uh, that was taken from his waistband. From that point and from the outset of these cases, our detectives, the men and women of our police department, our, 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 our state attorney's office uh, that, that was from the very beginning on the scene, out there with our detectives, working, working this case from start to finish, did not stop until we found justice for our victims. We know that this case met the bare minimum definition of, a, of, of serial murders because of the speed with which we were able to solve it. Had we not had our, our real-time crime center, had we not had this great relationship with private uh, businesses in our community, sure, we could have matched the two scenes to each other. We still wouldn't have had video of, uh, of the vehicle involved, of the license plate. We wouldn't have known where to go find that firearm. Our detectives, again, uh, our, our assistant state attorneys, literally followed our suspect's footsteps from the moment he left his apartment to the time that he went and committed his first attempted murder on December 21st to the time he walked back, got in his car, and murdered Mr. Price within two hours. So again, this, this, is a, this was an all-hands effort that could not have been accomplished by any one agency, by any one person. And so I, I just, my hat's off to everybody that's, uh, that's standing here with me. I can tell you that, that American cities are, are at a crossroads right now, and our city, thanks to, to our elected leadership, our appointed leadership, uh, our, our interim chief of policemen, Omar Morales, have made the decision that in Miami we're investing in public safety, and we're not, we're not abandoning people that other societies may have, uh, may have considered disposable or may have forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Ron Book. I don't, I don't know how this gentleman does it. I just saw him in Tallahassee last night. Um, you do so much good for this world, so Thank please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam State Attorney. You know, how do you, how do you answer a crime, a series of crimes that must be considered the most heinous? One in every, one in a quarter of every homeless person who lives in our community is an elderly person, underlying health care issues. The victim here wasn't one of those 70 or 80 year olds. The average homeless individual lives 13 to 17 fewer years than ours. And in this case, you have somebody who only wants to do harm to the most vulnerable in our community. Frankly, the chief really summed it up. The people behind me and all of the people that line up behind them every single day, Chief, we call them the least, the lost, the last, and the forgotten. But they're not the least, the last, and the forgotten by the city of Miami. They're not the least, the last, and lost, and the forgotten by our federal agencies or our state agencies. And they are certainly not the least, the last, and the lost, and the forgotten to this state attorney's office. There have been many days that I have been asked to come up here and meet with state attorney and her team about various aspects of homelessness and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. While I can stand here and say this is one of the saddest days in the 26 years that I have been the chair 
of the Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust. But I can also look at all of you and say it's the proudest day. And it's the proudest day because these men and women and the men and women that backed them up and the men and women that took those magnifying glasses out and tracked that killer, that murderer, of the most innocent of innocent, because let's be clear, those three individuals, they weren't harming anybody. They weren't doing any harm to anybody. Mr. Price was known to the Homeless Trust. He's in our HMIS system, which is our homeless management information system. We knew who he was. We knew who he was. And you know who he was? He was a man with a face. He was a man with a mind. He was a man whose luck wasn't like yours and mine today. Those three individuals are individuals with mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. And for forever, whatever the reasons were, they found themselves on the streets. Proud, I'm proud to live in a community where I can look around me and say I feel well protected. I can look around me and know that while there are people out on the streets tonight, we started 26 years ago. There were a little over 8,000 people mm -hmm. unsheltered in this community. Tonight, last Thursday night, our trust team, together with the city's outreach teams, counted every single individual that was on the streets. Mm. Last year this time, we had 892, but we had eight hotels full of quarantined and isolated homeless individuals. We were protecting that way. The count, approximately 940 last Thursday night, down from just over 8,000. That's because we live in a village that cares and has been able to reduce homelessness by 90% while the people in Los Angeles tonight go to bed with a little over 71,000 unsheltered on their streets. This is a community that cares. It's a village that cares. And I'm proud to be a part of this village. And I'm a proud to be a part of the village, Chief, as you said not only the elected officials, the appointed officials, and all of the men and women of your department and the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms at the federal level. We thank you. Thank you for keeping us safe. And thank you for caring about our people who other people think are faceless. They're not. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. I'm so glad you were able to make it and, and really understand and touch the hearts of who those folks were, those victims. And thank you for everything you've done for all of us, really.